Jonathan Van Tam, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, thank you very much for joining us. With us today are a group of viewers who were among hundreds of people who sent in questions on a range of topics. I will also read some of them out from here in the studio. Well, our first question today comes from Moses Zikasoka. Moses. My African community here in London has been disproportionately affected by coronavirus, including myself losing my sister early on in the pandemic. It is reported that around 70% of the black community is refusing the vaccine due to misinformation often spread on social media. And the current government media campaign isn't working for us. So what is the government going to do to convince the black community to accept the vaccine? Professor. Thanks very much. The, the question was a little indistinct, but I, I think I heard it OK. And I am as concerned as you are that um, uptake of the vaccine when it is offered to people needs to be high in all walks of society in the UK and in all communities. And I share your concerns that the acceptance in um, ethnic minority communities is not as high as I would like it to be and is not as high at the moment as in the um, indigenous white population. And I think there are multiple complex reasons why that is so, but it is really important that um, leaders and medical leaders from the different communities, and I don't want to lump them all together because I think that's wrong, um, but leaders must come forwards and explain to their communities, first of all, what a horrible illness this is, secondly, how important vaccines are going to be in the fullness of time in terms of lifting us out of the problems we currently face. So I think you've raised a very fair point. I share your concerns and um, we are pressing as hard as we can to make sure that um, messaging is going to be as tailored as possible to each of the communities. But, you know, I'll say to everyone who's listening, this virus just does not distinguish between um, races, um, it, uh, it attacks us all, and the vaccine is really important for us all. Moses' question, perhaps the bit you didn't hear, was what's the government going to do about this? Do you need more black doctors up there on the podium with you? Yes, I, I need more um, physicians and healthcare workers right from across the um, you know, wonderful broad spectrum of our society to come forwards and help me and help others to get these messages home that the vaccine is really important, that the disease does not discriminate by race and that vaccine is going to be an extremely important way out of this for us in the fullness of time. Well, thank you. Our next question comes from Arshad Daoud, chair of Balam Mosque and Tooting Islamic Centre. He's a community organiser. Arshad. Arshad, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Yes, hi, good afternoon. So as a community organiser for a mosque in South London, um, I've spoken to many people um, about their reservations taking the vaccine. Um, I've heard many conspiracy theories, as I'm sure we all have, and worries that the vaccine will lead to infertility, for example. So as part of your medical risk assessment, what side, what side effects have been considered for, of the vaccine and what can you comment on about the severity of COVID symptoms after taking the vaccination? Professor. Okay, thank, thank you for the question. That's um, quite a complex one. The first one really was um, your question about um, the rumours and that is all they are, uh, rumours about infertility and the vaccine. There are absolutely no data whatsoever to support that. And if there were data to support that, the MHRA would have made a clear position statement on that. Um, and I don't know of any vaccines that affect fertility. That's period. So from that perspective, all I can do is just refute that head on and say, I believe that to be an unfounded rumour. Now, on the point about um, safety assessment and um, <clears throat> adverse events, 
we know that all vaccines have side effects and the common ones with the vaccines that we are using, either the Pfizer um, or the AstraZeneca, are um, first of all soreness and redness at the site of the injection, which frankly is to be expected when you've had a needle in your arm. And uh, then following on from that, um, quite often delayed by a few hours, um, headache, fatigue, and feeling a little bit flu-like, that's the best expression I could probably give, for a few hours, but in almost all cases, very self-limiting and very short-lived. Um, but the MHRA, the, our regulator, reviews all the yellow card safety data and the reports from members of the public every day, and uh, we are not seeing any worrisome safety signals at all at the moment in relation to either of the two vaccines so deployed. We did also have questions online about medium and long-term side effects. Is it that we just don't know? It is always the case with any medicine or any vaccine that is new, that if you're looking for a side effect that is really, really rare, shall we say, I don't know, you know, a very, very low number in um, several million people, that's how rare, then of course you can't pick that up in a clinical trial. Because although these clinical trials have been really big, um, typically 30 to 40,000 volunteers in each of the clinical trials, then um, you can't pick up those very, very rare signals until literally tens of millions of people have had the vaccines. But I would say that the um, the study of safety information is not just a kind of UK specific affair, it's an international cooperative affair and vaccines are now being rolled out in many parts of the world, particularly in the US and particularly in Israel. And again, if the regulators, our regulator, the MHRA, were picking up any kind of signal they were concerned about um, from elsewhere, they would delve into that and tell us. But at the moment, um, all is good. We had by far the most questions uh, in our appeal uh, pertaining to the question of delaying the second dose from the original three or four weeks to 12 weeks. Uh, with a question on that topic, yes. let me bring in Natalie Gazet, who's a web designer. Natalie. Hi. Um, yeah, I'd like to know your opinion on the vaccine dosage delay and why we're the only country delaying the second dose to 12 weeks, despite Pfizer and the World Health Organization statements recommending otherwise. Is there any evidence for this 12-week delay? Thanks for the question. And it is a common one. And um, I do understand the anxiety. So I'll take a little bit of time to explain it. And you'll have to forgive me for taking a bit of time. The first thing to say is that um, many countries around the world are looking with enormous interest um, at the approach the UK um, has taken. And I understand the state of Quebec in Canada, who have always been known to be quite innovative and uh, forward thinking about how they use vaccines, have also now adopted the UK approach. So we're not the only country in the world. Um, but I understand, nevertheless, the concerns that are being raised. And let me try and explain the arguments to you. We are in a space right now where supplies of vaccine are constrained. They are constrained in the UK and they are constrained internationally. Although the UK is in pretty much the best position in the whole world in that we know we have committed in total to 367 million doses of vaccine in the fullness of time. They don't all come at once, they can't all be made at once, and they haven't all passed through authorization at this point in time. So right now we are constrained. And the, the basic mathematics runs that if you, for example, had a vaccine that after one dose, and this, these are theoretical percentages I'm giving you, I want to stress that very strongly, but if you had a vaccine that theoretically after one dose gave you a 45% protection, 
and after the second dose it gave you another 45 and brought you up to 90. Then if you had two vaccines and two people, you would get the equal public health effect from giving both of those vaccines to one person or from giving them one vaccine each because 45 plus 45 equals 90. So any effects of the first dose in that illustration I gave you greater than 45% mean that if I split the doses and give them to two people rather than the one person then I am gaining at a population level in terms of the amount of protection I can deliver to a lot of people in the shortest period of time with a limited amount of vaccine. And of course if the 45% goes up to 60% as a, another theoretical example then I'm beginning to gain even more and that is the basic argument and with that goes the fact that if we don't prioritize the first dose to as many high-risk people as possible the direct consequence of that is that more of those high-risk people will have to wait longer for their first dose and I realize that for people who've already had their first dose and they desperately want their second that their self-interest is in having that as soon as possible but there is a public health argument that this is the right way to do it. Now the situation has been more complicated I'm afraid by different claims about the effectiveness of the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine in particular and I'm going to tackle this head-on and say that if you look at the FDA website where the data are publicly available you can look at those data and you can calculate the 52 percent effectiveness that Pfizer um, uh, claim absolutely you can but if you look at the same data and you analyze them in a different way you can also arrive at a much higher figure um, the high 80 percents as our own expert committee the JCVI has done and the difference using the same data is this if you count all cases of COVID-19 that occur after vaccine is given as vaccine preventable you can get to the 52 percent figure but if you say and I believe this is right and so do most experts that vaccine does not protect you instantly you don't have it on a Tuesday and Wednesday you're protected it takes time for the antibodies to build up almost certainly 14 days and in, in many older people longer than that probably 21 now if you cut the same data and say we're going to look at cases after 21 days after the vaccine has been given then you get these much higher estimates of effectiveness and this is where we are in terms of the science that we can get a lot of benefit from the first dose and because we can get a lot of benefit from the first dose it is the right thing to do to prioritize that first dose for as many people as possible we're not deliberately delaying the second dose we are saying that the priority is the first dose and the inevitability of the constrained supply is that the second doses are going to be delayed for an interval of up to 12 weeks sorry that was long-winded but I hope it gave you a really clear explanation for the thinking it did but, but I, I have to put to you the fears of a lot of people asking the questions which is which is about how long that protection will last and they say that you don't have the data to show that that protection even if it is at 89 percent lasts eight nine ten weeks is it correct that you don't have the data to, to, you know, to, to say to people, we know that you're still protected to 89% at 10 weeks? Well, it's not entirely true to say that we don't have the data. Let me, let me answer that in two ways. First of all, if you have a vaccine that is giving you, as the JCVI 
have recommended and, and stated to us, um, typically in the high 80%, um, after first dose and we know that in the Pfizer study that was measured out to 42 days that is not going to just go along and drop off a cliff and go from the high 80s to nearly nothing in a very short period of time uh, that just doesn't happen with antibody profiles but you don't know do the you? the next thing to say it, no, no let me finish please the next thing to say there are two more points I'd like to make the next thing to say is that vaccines also give a very strong T-cell response and we know that the Pfizer vaccine does that. And we actually know antibody levels are rather modest after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine and yet the protection is really very good. And so please don't forget that the T-cells may well be very important in this. The next point is that for the Moderna vaccine, and again these data are available on the FDA website, this is not secret information, the Moderna vaccine studies people who have only had one dose ever, very small number compared to their total trial, but it's still a thousand or so I think, um, who've only ever had one dose and they look at, can follow those data up to 104 days and that's a messenger RNA vaccine too. And um, the efficacy figure on the FDA website, I, I can't remember the precise uh, level, but it's 80%, I think, or something very similar. So that's another piece of kind of corroborative information. Okay. And the final point I want to make is that we're talking about percentage vaccine efficacy against infection. Now, what actually really matters given the situation we're in now is whether these vaccines reduce hospitalizations and it may well be that we see a much stronger signal for hospitalizations even if we were to see a slightly lower signal for the prevention of infection and that's really important if we can stop people going into hospital then we turn this from a serious illness into one that we can manage in the community. Well, ju just a question briefly then from Cam, who is a junior doctor, who says, as a medical professional, I'm seeing a few of my colleagues get COVID after one dose of vaccine. I imagine you must have data on this. When will the government have enough evidence to agree to roll out an earlier second dose? Right, thank you for that um, question. Um, so. I can tell you already that the unsung heroes of this pandemic um, are pe people such as um, Dr Nick Andrews at the uh, um, uh, health uh, Public Health England in um, uh, Collindale and they are already working on linking up the national immunisation records to the testing data that we have in the UK and it will be possible quite soon to start to get some estimates of vaccine effectiveness but we are not quite there yet I don't have any um, figures to share with you today and they will come in the next I'm estimating one to two to three weeks that kind of time period it takes time you have to follow the data and follow um, how long people have been vaccinated for to understand uh, vaccine effectiveness. And the first data will always be data about infections. Later, we'll get data on hospitalizations and on deaths. It will take time, but I want to assure you that it is coming. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Frida, who's a retired primary school teacher and joins us from York. Frida. Hello, Professor. I will be receiving my first dose on Saturday. My grandsons are seven and five, are children of, of key workers and have been at school. How long after getting my first jab is it safe for me to look after them and take care of them in my home after school? Is it three weeks or is it longer? Right, thank you, Frida. And that's a really important question. And, um, what I'm saying to people when I give them the vaccine, when I work in the vaccine clinics, is this, that until we have vaccinated literally tens of millions of people and we, have, um, we are beginning to establish a vaccinated population, 
and we are seeing the levels of disease in the community, which are high right now, really high, properly coming down and staying down. And until we have the data that assures us that the vaccines are highly effective, as I expect them to be, all of the rules still apply, I'm afraid, even if you've had your first dose of vaccine. But on a slightly kind of narrower point about when I would expect um, you to have any degree of protection from your first dose, I would be very clear with you if you were my patient and I would say to you, please don't assume um, that you will have any protection until at least 21 days has elapsed. So I think my answer is in two parts to you. Um, it takes quite some weeks before the vaccine protection will build up from the first dose that you've had. And secondly, much as you would like to see your grandchildren and look after them again, as much as I desperately would like to see my mum um, but can't, all of, the, all of the rules, I'm afraid, just have to apply to us all for a little bit longer. You know, it, these are the hard yards, they really are, and I know that. But we are so tantalisingly close now, maybe just a few months away, from um, the vaccine rollout changing all of our lives for the better. So we've just got to keep the faith and, and stick with it, I'm afraid, for just a teeny bit longer. Our next question came from Twitter and was about the mutation of the virus and the threat that that poses. It's from Rune Beck and it says, with the apparent speed of new variations, is it realistic to update and scale vaccinations fast enough to catch up and win the race? Thank you. That's a really important question. And um, I, d I don't mind saying to you that, um, you know, my work behind the scenes is so much focused on um, the future of vaccines and vaccination, not only in this country, but for the world. So let me kind of chop the question up into bits. Um, the first thing to say is that there are um, three um, mutations that we know of, variants, that are of um, public health concern. Maybe you'd say there were four if you count, if you say there are two from Brazil. But basically, um, there is the um, UK variant, which has emerged. There's the South African variant. And there are two from Brazil. And we're picking up these variants in countries which have very, very good genetic sequencing capability. There may well be more around the world in countries who don't even know about it because they don't have the same level of, gen of genetic sequencing as uh, particularly we do and the South Africans do, etc. So that's the first point. The second point is that these viruses, these variants, did not emerge under vaccine pressure. So if you have a very highly vaccinated population, to continue to exist, the virus wants to find a way round the vaccine. And it's called um, vaccine pressure on the virus. But these variants just occurred. Um, they did not occur in highly vaccinated populations at the time they occurred. So they were, if you like, spontaneous um, variations. Now, that makes the likelihood that they are going to completely destroy the vaccines we have very low. It, we would be incredibly unlucky if that was the case. But none of us can rule out the possibility that vaccines won't work quite as well against some of these variants. Now, I think the science data, as it's building up, is beginning to give us a fair amount of reassurance that um, the UK variant is going to be susceptible to the vaccines that we are deploying now. And indeed, when we have effectiveness data from Public Health England, I'm hoping in the next fortnight or so, then um, some of those data will actually be against the new variant. And so that will hopefully give us a great deal of confidence at that point. I think the variants in South Africa and Brazil 
are more of a concern. How much of a concern? I think the science, need, science community need to do some more work and I'm, they are working like mad on this to try and get us those steers. But yes, of course, these variants are of concern. Now, what I don't want is a headline from Channel 4 or anywhere, anywhere else saying um, Van Tam says X, Y or Z. But um, I am certainly framing the possibility that we may need in time to vary the strains in our vaccines. And I am framing the possibility that we need to realistically consider if at some point in the future we are going to need to revaccinate some of our population. So I don't want a headline. Van Tam says we're definitely going to have to revaccinate. I didn't say that. I said that I'm framing these behind the scenes as realistic things that I have to consider with the science experts to make sure that the UK stays exactly where it is, absolutely on the front foot on vaccines and um, ready to respond to what happens next. But this is new, uncharted territory and it is very tricky. But the implication is that we will be playing catch up if it changes again. And that, that means we, we may not escape uh, from this period of trying to catch up with the virus as easily as some people think. I disagree with you. And the reason I disagree with you is that um, from the lab studies that look at antibodies, you really can't assess T-cell immunity. And it's a perfectly realistic possibility, perfectly realistic, that people who've been vaccinated with the current vaccines will, when they encounter a future variant, have a much more milder form of the illness than they would have had if they had not been vaccinated. In other words, it brings into VISTA the possibility that over time, with well-vaccinated populations, um, coronavirus may become far more manageable than it has been in the first 12 months of its life in humans. OK, um, Professor, I'm, I'm aware time is getting on and we've got some viewers here who've got very sort of focused questions. I wonder if we could try and get through them as quickly as possible. I know it's difficult, but if we could try and sort of speed up a little bit to try and get through as many as we can. Um, the next question is from Sarah Bailey. Well, those statistics released by the ONS this week suggest that school staff and teachers are no more likely to die of COVID-19 than the general population. The high transmission rates, particularly in secondary schools where I'm a head teacher, cannot be denied. Whilst I understand and support the rationale for prioritising the vaccination of the vulnerable, what timescale should we expect for the rollout of vaccines to school staff, given the damaging impact on children's mental health while schools remain closed? OK, I understand the question. I'll give you a very quick answer. The top priority right now is to vaccinate the JCVI um, priority cohorts 1 to 9, as defined by age and as defined by chronic illnesses. Once we have got through that, there will be a phase 2 vaccination programme in the UK. The shape of that will be decided upon by ministers who are currently considering what that might look like. And I absolutely understand that... Um, in the mix are considered on considerations around um, occupational groupings um, as well as other factors such as uh, transmission. But you yourself have said it that we don't see a signal in the ONS data of increased infection rates in teachers, probably slightly lower uh, than, than equivalent for age and sex, and we don't see a signal of increased mortality. Thank you. Uh, Medina Ali is an 18-year-old A-level student. Medina. Hi, my question is, since exams were announced as cancelled, what has changed for the government to now say that we must go back to school despite the lockdown we're living in? Sorry, could you repeat that question again? Just the last bit. Um, since exams were announced as cancelled, what has changed for the government to now say we have to go back to school despite the lockdown we're living in? OK, so um, getting children back to school is... Um, one of the most, 
the most important thing, I think, that we would like to achieve. And uh, that said with um, real feeling, with um, three children, two of whom are at school and one of whom is at university. So I'm desperate for this to happen, but it has to happen at a time when the general epidemiological situation in the UK is safe. And right now, disease levels, although falling, are still extremely high. The hospitals are rammed with COVID patients. And we do know that although schools are safe in themselves in terms of the environment, that transmission still occurs between uh, school children and school children then bring it into their homes and give it to the adults. So it's a very fine and difficult decision that the government will have to make. Um, but we're all committed. We understand uh, on the medical side the public health benefits and mental health benefits of kids being in school as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Andy Veach, who is from Faversham in Kent and has been shielding since last March. Andy. I'm a blood cancer patient with MDS, myelodysplastic syndromes. And my concern is that we're told not to expect the vaccine to protect us because of our compromised immune systems. Will we be tested after vaccination to find out if we develop any immunity or are blood cancer patients destined to spend much of the rest of their lives shielding? And shouldn't family members living with any clinically extremely vulnerable person be vaccinated at the same time as the patient? My wife is a key worker in a supermarket, and it's a huge worry for us that she will bring COVID home to me. We've therefore stayed apart as much as we can at home since last March, and we can see no end in this situation. Thank you for the questions. Look, I agree it's a, it's a horrible situation to be in. Um, I agree that um, it is just no fun at all to have been shielding for that length of time and it must be a real worry about the vaccines and whether they are going to work in people who have damaged immune systems, either through disease or through treatment. And um, it is just a case in point that the vaccines need our immune system in order to work to get us to generate the antibodies that give us protection. And it is, I'm not going to mince my words here, you know I tend not to. It is possible that the vaccine response in people who are immunosuppressed will be lower, but it could still be incredibly meaningful in terms of preventing severe disease. So I, you mu I must encourage you that when you're called for your vaccine to take it, and I must encourage all people to do that because, you know, this isn't zero protection, it may be lowered. I can't say. We are doing the studies. Um, uh, um, academics in Birmingham University have been commissioned by us to look at um, the response to vaccines in people who are immunocompromised, and we will have further data on that. But in terms of the, you know, how do I get out of this trap, um, which I completely understand how you must feel, Please think of the vaccines a bit like surround sound. It's not just about um, you and patients like you being vaccinated. It's about the people around you and the people you're likely to encounter in society also being vaccinated so that the levels of disease altogether come down. And when they come down to low levels, every time we step outside the house, the chances of meeting the infection are therefore much lower. And on the final point about um, contacts of um, uh, the clinically extremely vulnerable, the JCVI has looked and continues to look at these questions very diligently. They are an independent expert body and um, I'm going to stick with the advice that they offer to us. Thank you. Um, I want to bring in now Sanjay Ranchodas, who's a businessman and a parent and is in Hertfordshire. Sanjay. Hi, Professor. Do you find it difficult um, to stand beside um, politicians when they're making policies that go against the science? Um, how can a medical profession, professional and scientist like yourself support such a political message, such as the ones we're seeing out there? You know, if you go out, you can spread it, people will die. 
Um, and the second part of my question is, I mean, it's a disgrace that 100,000 people have died in the UK. And what would you have done differently? Professor, thank you. Thank you. OK, so the first one really is a kind of career question about the role of um, science and medical advisors um, in government. And um, our job as advisors is always to advise our ministers and for ministers as, as you know, uh, uh, ministers of the elected government, elected by the people, make the decisions. And, you know, I, I, I think when I stand alongside politicians, I'll just tell it the way it is, I'll tell you the truth. I find them deeply committed and concerned individuals who on the COVID-19 piece have run out of easy decisions to make. There are no easy decisions to make when the things that bring the infection down and prevent the deaths that you um, talked about are blunt things that also do collateral damage. And those are the awful decisions that politicians are faced with, not just in the UK, but around the world. And there's never been a time when politicians and ministers need good impartial science advice as much as they do at the moment. But they do have some incredibly difficult decisions to make. Now, on the um, what could we have done better, I'm not going to do a um, public inquiry um, uh, live in the couple of minutes that remains on this programme. But obviously, you know, you want me to say something. And one thing I will say is that um, in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, the testing capability simply did not exist in the UK, nor in any part of the world, and particularly so in mainland Europe. And so it wasn't possible because there wasn't the testing capability and certainly not the testing capacity just kind of sat there waiting to go to um, spot this first wave until it had already started to encroach on the hospitals. And, you know, that is something that no doubt will be played back time and time again. Um, but it is a regret. Um, it's not an apology. It's a regret that we did not have the testing capability, frankly, anywhere in the world um, to deal with this virus and the speed with which it encroached upon us. There was a lot of surprise after the Prime Minister said yesterday the government did absolutely everything it could. Do you agree with that, that the government did absolutely everything it could? I think the, um, the government's had to, like every other government around the world, has had to um, build this ship um, while sailing in it at the same time. It has been an incredibly challenging time for people doing their level best to try and help the societies that, that they serve. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's as, as simple as that. Just in the last minute, a lot of people have been wanting to have some hope about looking forward to the summer. We had a very brief question from Ben Walker, who's a teacher. Ben, just ask your question very briefly. Um, would you be looking to go on holiday abroad this summer and would you be advising your mum after her job to go abroad this summer on holiday? Um, my my mum, I don't think, would go abroad on holiday anyway. Um, I think it's very difficult to judge um, whether it's going to be possible or advisable to, to, to go, on, go, go abroad this summer. I think we have to wait and see a little longer um, how things play out in terms of um, the whole um, international situation. But obviously for us as um, uh, people who live very close to the mainland Europe where many of us go on holiday, uh, you know, I think it's a, a, a difficult and dynamic and moving situation. Professor Van Tam, thank you very much indeed for joining us and for answering our viewers' questions. I hope you'll come back another time and answer some more. Well, what did you think of that? Ben, what did you make of him? I think that he's the best communicator the government have got. I think he should be fronting more programmes. He should be there in the breakfast, 
at tea time. He he communicates answers in a clear, concise way. And, and I think he's an honest communicator, and an honest broker. Sanjay, you had the, the challenging question. What did you make of his answer? Yeah, I thought he was very sincere in his answer. Um, and um, I think he, um, you know, indirectly acknowledged the point um, and that um, he um, probably would have done something differently, but he definitely towed the political line there, didn't he? Anyone else? What, what did you think of him? Um, I actually don't think he answered my question completely. I think he spun around it. He was talking about, in theory, it would work. But my question was actually, is there any evidence for it? Which is still, I feel, unanswered. You know, would he have the confidence to tell my 86-year-old grandma that she, you know, that after her 12-week jab, she's as protected as she was at if she'd got it at three weeks? So for me, he's great. He's one of the more trustworthy ones that there is, but I still didn't feel like my question was completely answered, actually. Which is extraordinary, because I think it was the longest answer we've ever had to a yeah, question on Channel Yeah, it was, and I feel like, yeah, sometimes they talk a lot and talk a lot and talk a lot, yeah, but miss, definitely. miss the bits that we really are looking for. Definitely did avoid some of the questions that were asked by rephrasing it in a different way to make it look like he did answer the question. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I think the one about the BAME, the biggest challenge we have is not uh, people coming forward because um, of misinformation, it's because of lack of trust of information of the government. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of mistrust and that's the problem people have. And I think he has to try and communicate that and be part of that team, is that uh, how do we build trust? Because once we have the trust, people will come forward. And the trust will come from people from government themselves stepping forward and being vaccinated. That's a big mistake the government have made. They should have a PR campaign where they have either the whole cabinet or leading members of society come forward, become vaccinated, that will reassure the rest of the population. But they themselves are not coming forward. So how do they expect the rest of the population to come forward? I agree, I agree with that totally, um, Moses, because uh, you know one of the, the question that I asked is about reservations on the vaccine and the long-term impact will an example of that is infertility and that's just one example but he honed in on that specifically and said no but there are a lot of other potential long-term impacts that people are talking about the conspiracy about you know injecting um something into you so you can be tracked and the 5g thing and there are all these things that people are hearing and mishearing on um you know misinformation if you like and fake news and whatsapp groups and all sorts of things and those are the things that need to be taken head on in my opinion and the number of people that take up the vaccine is quite key really in in um uh, jonathan van tam's response to, to my question um is that whilst the vaccination doesn't particularly offer us any real hope in the in the short to medium term we're reliant on the take-up of um the rest of the population so the issues that you've raised are are extremely relevant in that i mean i also want to add on to what moses was saying it all comes down to the trust in the government if no one trusts the government and their plans or if they think that there is some sort of um lack of transparency in the plans that they have to better the uk then they're not really going to come forward and do take the precautions needed to help our society to move further. Bernie, what did you think? We didn't get to your question, I'm afraid, about zero COVID policy. No, he didn't. Uh, I thought it was perfectly lined up for that question at the end um, because he avoided uh, mentioning South Pacific countries that have dealt with this very well. Um, and we've had public health experts telling us from the beginning that we should follow a zero COVID policy like New Zealand did. They had a zero COVID policy and it worked out very, very well for them. Um, so, and I'm a bit concerned that even with the vaccine, we're going to have to suppress the uh, virus as much as we can. And so we should be listening to our public health experts, such as Devi and John Ashton. Anyone else? Before we before we before we end this, it's, it's very good getting your perspectives. Actually, I think we'll put this online. 
think what was important um, for me, Krishnan, was, you know, clearly he's a very senior medical professional within this country. You know, he, he's leading the charge, if you like. Um, but it seemed to me that there's still some very unanswered questions and glaring holes in um, everybody's understanding about this virus, I think, which still, you know, is, is going to make people very uneasy about plans moving forward. Well, thank you all very much. That was really interesting. Thanks for coming and making time and for listening. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thanks, Krishna.